Hi, good morning everyone. Um, the first part of the, the title of this talk is taken from an editorial in the Daily Herald of June 1921, when a public controversy over the training of animals for use on the musical stage and in the circus and fairground was at its height. But criticism of performing animal acts had been expressed some time before. Um, for example, Samuel Johnson had supposedly commented, I'd rather see a man on four legs than a dog on two. In 1896, quite some late time later, after Samuel Levy Ben Susan in the Animals Guardian had called attention to the so-called barbarities practiced in animal training for the stage, the Daily Chronicle attempted a systematic investigation of allegations of cruelty. The Performing Animals Defence Committee was soon after established by Ernest Bell of the Humanitarian League in 1914. Pressure on performing animal interests increased on the founding of the International Jack London Club in 1918, following publication in Britain in the previous year of London's critical novel, Michael, Brother of Jerry, focusing on the alleged cruelty behind animal performances, and in which the author, in his foreword, appealed to readers to take simple direct action against them by walking out. A study of the performing animals controversy that then grew up in Britain after the First World War allows an investigation of the behaviour of pressure groups, the press, politicians and trade associations. Following a failed British parliamentary bill aimed at prohibition, a select committee was appointed in 1921 and reconvened in 1922. Its brief was to inquire into the conditions under which performing animals are trained and exhibited and to consider whether legislation is desirable to prohibit or regulate such training and exhibition and if so, what lines such legislation should follow. The 15 committee members as MPs evenly reflected on the one hand those, some representing the humane societies who believed that cruelty was an existing problem and on the other, those, some representing professional interests, who believed it was not. They summoned 43 witnesses, about half of whom were critical of animal training, performances, accommodation or transport arrangements, the others defending the status quo against intrusive legislation and tending to deny the existence of cruelty. Evidence covered the previous 25 years, but difficulty was experienced in obtaining evidence of cruelty from persons who considered that their chances of continued employment in the music hall and circus might be endangered. The only witness able to offer an objective scientific interpretation of the issues addressed by the committee was Peter Chalmers Mitchell. And he was accepted by many on the committee as their most valuable witness, having been appointed secretary of the Zoological Society of London in 1903 and a fellow of the Royal Society in 1906. Although during the hearings he refused to take sides, preferring to be cross-examined, he later wrote in 1929, I am strongly opposed to performing animals, both as a zoologist and a humanitarian. The minutes of the select committee show that witnesses more usually provided opinion rather than the first-hand evidence sought after and this reflected the secret nature of much of the preparation of animals for performance. However, the committee eventually reported that cruelty did exist, that the public was opposed to it, and that the profession was willing to cooperate against it. This inquiry also gave new emphasis to lasting areas of concern about the accommodation and transport of animals. The Select Committee report itself contains extensive comment from witnesses on the following areas, and much more. What might be terrifying or unnatural acts, such as dogs doing back somersaults, disagreement over training by fear or kindness, or punishment or reward, which was at the centre of the controversy. Um, and this is a 
a pamphlet of that time which shows the alleged cruelty involved in training a dog to balance on one leg, starting off with the trainer's assistant applying the brutalising part of the training, followed by the man who would actually appear on stage, who befriends the dog and relieves a bit of, bit of its suffering and so conditions it for the performance. The select com committee also considered <coughs> um, suspicion of the use of cruelty for quick <coughs> results or to ensure animals perform to timetable, which timetable is very tight on the musical stage. You had to come in, do your act, and leave at a particular point. They considered cruel devices such as the collapsible cage for the magician's disappearing bird trick or whips, spikes, electric shocks, hot iron bars and so on. Uh, differentiation between wild, domesticated and so-called docile animals. The effect on animal dignity, especially when an animal was invested with national symbol symbolism like the so-called British lion. The supposed effect on children of seeing animal acts. Trade characterization of pressure groups as so-called killjoys, hysterical cranks, teetotalers or busybodies. So after the resulting Performing Animals Regulation Act of 1925, which brought about licensing rather than prohibition, the controversy reduced but did not disappear. This act was regarded as unacceptable by prohibitionists critical of animal performance in the musical variety theatre and circus and later in film and advertising. Repeated attempts were made over the ensuing decades to reform it. The campaign against trained animal acts was now to be spearheaded by the Performing Animals Defence League which had grown, up, grown from Ernest Bell's 1914 committee. From 1931 to 1968 it was led by the eccentric and uncompromising Captain Edmund McMichael. Um, his surviving personal papers were lent to me by his daughter, Esther Denham, a veterinary surgeon. They extend from the 1920s to the 1960s and reflect the early development of high-profile direct action in the fearless pursuit of a cause and the motives, arguments and effects of an organisation vigorously opposed to animal performance. The intensity of the campaign was sustained because, as in animal experimentation, the main activity under attack, the training of animals, was conducted behind closed doors. McMichael had been an intelligence officer and German-speaking spy in the First World War, and at its end he was given the job of minding the Kaiser's sister, afterwards becoming a journalist on the Daily Herald, a newspaper that would take a strong stand against animal performance. Esther Bright, his father-in-law's sister, a suffragette and theosophist, that's her sitting in the centre there, um, and close friend of Annie Besant, sparked his interest in animal issues and vegetarianism, and with a considerable inheritance later helped him financially during his numerous court cases, as against the circus owner Bertram Mills. Esther became a life member of the League and was also a member of the Women's Freedom Leagues, League in the 1920s. But Michael adopted many of the principles and beliefs of members of his extended family, such as Esther Bright. He became a vegetarian, advocated nature cure instead of conventional medicine, opposed the germ theory of disease and helped in the work of the anti National Anti-Vaccination League. He also adopted unorthodox religious views, referring to the Aquarian Gospel as revealing Christ's true teaching on the treatment of animals. And in 1944, he promised support for the ordination of women if they would reform the church's attitude to animal cruelty. But Michael's philosophy and outlook, his conflict with the RSPCA and his, his civil disobedience and his repeated imprisonments provide a fascinating context for the history of early direct action against animal performance. McMichael became frustrated with the relatively moderate tactics used by the RSPCA in a variety of animal welfare issues. He wrote to its chairman, Sir Robert Gower, in 1931 about Lord Lonsdale's unacceptable conflict of interest as both a vice president of the RSPCA 
and president of Bertram Mills International Circus at London Olympia. A dispute with Gower then escalated, resulting in Michael's expulsion from the RSPCA, despite his attempts to involve its chief patron, the King, and its president, the Prince of Wales. The problem of animals in film produced further bad feeling. When the Select Committee met in 1921 and 1922, there had been almost no reference to the use of animals in film production. Very soon afterwards, the film and cinema industry, alongside the circus, overtook the declining music hall as a focus of attention for the League. The RSPCA was also concerned with the problem and its solution occasioned further disagreements with Michael. He wrote to the Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, in 1934 about their proposed Cinematograph Films Animals Bill, describing it as a spurious measure and worthless. He enclosed a copy of the League's proposed Cinematograph Protection of Animals Bill and alongside his complaint. The RSPCA's bill at this stage dealt, dealt solely with what appeared on the screen and not with any cruelty that occurred during the production. Because he was prepared to place his moral conscience above laws that he felt unjust and then to ignore or challenge them without compromise, it was inevitable that McMichael came into frequent contact with the police and courts. For example, in 1940, there was a high court case between himself as plaintiff, self-represented, self and the commissioner of the London Metropolitan Police as defendant. Ironically, McMichael regarded his direct action as a form of voluntary police work because he felt that the proper authorities were not enforcing the inadequate laws that already existed. In a letter of 1942 to a Miss Lote of the National Anti-Vivisection League, he described his philosophy of God, mankind and the animals. He advocated equality of income to remove the vested interests that make cruelty profitable and open to divine retribution on mankind, as in the nation's suffering in the current war. He would not help in the war effort, but one of his aims was to meet Hitler in the name of the people of Britain and with clean hands, to persuade him to introduce his policy into Germany and end the war. If necessary, this would be achieved by a challenge of single combat, on horse or on foot with sword, lance, battle axe or mace. McMichael's eminent correspondent and sometime leader of the Labour Party, George Lansbury, was similarly a pacifist who worked to prevent a Second World War. He managed a more conventional meeting with Hitler before the outbreak of hostilities. Like McMichael, he had gone to prison for his politically inspired views and actions. In 1956, McMichael wrote to the Soviet ambassador, asking him only attend only to attend the Moscow State Circus if it was free of animal performance. He warned that although individual cruelty was the responsibility of individuals, organised cruelty was the responsibility of nations, leading to divine retribution, usually in the form of war. Much of his, much of his correspondence for the Performing Animals Defence League is laced with religious quotations. Kathleen Hanchett Stamford, whose husband Derek joined the League in the late 1950s as a part-time assistant to McMichael, told the Times, The League was the animal rights activists of their day. Captain McMichael liked being in trouble and going to court, where he would quote Greek, quote Greek and Latin. He was imprisoned many times for contempt of court and for refusing to pay rates when he thought they would be used to support circus visits on public land. Meanwhile, he made new links with other emerging animal welfare movements. In 1967, the Hunt Saboteurs Association sometimes targeted circuses, and McMichael attended a factory farm rally in Trafalgar Square in that year. When he died, he left Derek Hunch at Stamford in charge of the League, and tactics then softened. Campaigning relied on the writing of thousands of letters rather than on direct action. 
By the late 1970s, Hanchett Stamford had effective control over the League's assets, and in the early 1990s, he moved its offices to a Gothic mansion, Sid Abbey in Sidmouth. On his death in 2006, these assets amounted to nearly £2.5 million in property and shares. And after a court case, his wife Kathleen kept the assets from the Treasury so that she could donate them to the Born Free Foundation. How am I doing for time? One minute. There's not much time to deal with more recent developments or to discuss the work of the Captive Animals Protection Society, which was founded in 1957. There have also been significant publications on this subject as a present day problem. Martha Kylie Worthington's Controversial Animals in Circuses and Zoos, Chiron's World of 1990, and William Johnson's The Rose-Tinted Menagerie, also of 1990, and in 2007, for example, Paul McGreevy and Robert Bokes has published their Carrots and Sticks, Principles of Animal Training, based on the science of animal psychology and behaviour. You probably also know a that there's been quite a lot of discussion, argument and consultation very recently over the government's policy here in Britain on the use of wild animals in circuses. But that's not history yet. Okay, thank you very much.